Welcome to another edition of the Calgary Sessions. This is episode number 14. I'm your host, Jeff Humphreys. Today's guest um, will be a fun conversation. This dude is rather sharp, and uh, some might call him funny, maybe sarcastic. I'm not sure what word maybe he wants annoying. to use. <laughs> maybe annoying. I'll give him that one, too. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so this would be um, this would be a fun one to get into. I don't know his complete backstory. I, can, I know little bits and pieces, but I will let him introduce himself and uh, what he's up to, what, where he's working. Thank you. Yeah, fourteen. The Theo Fleury. Well, I was gonna say uh, you said I was gonna say Kent Nelson. Was he fourteen? Oh, I don't know. That predates me. Yeah. So you go no, Fleury. I go I Kent go, Nelson. I go Fleury. My cousin's gonna scold me if the, if I'm way out to lunch. <laughs> well, you've said it now. It's out there. Man. Internet's got no delete button. Uh, yeah, my story. Well, long time listener, first time caller. I guess it's uh, introduce yourself. What's your name, buddy? Kevin Morihira. Maybe some of you will reference me as Hefe. We'll see. We'll get into that story because sometimes that Good. there's there might be more people in this town that know me as that than, than my real name. Uh, but yeah, so currently owner founder of Peak PDC, which is my own show. It stands for Planning, Development, and Culture, and it's like the I told someone a while ago. It's like the In and Out Burger of menus. It's it's a simple two menu uh, or two item menu where it's I work with a lot of small business owners, owner operator businesses, we're helping them with marketing, strategic planning, operational consulting, anything to do with the true to running of their biz. And the other side of the menu is I work with a lot of call it white collar professionals who sell time. So it's lawyers, accountants, engineers, architects, other consultants, helping them, teaching them, working with them to teach them how to build their practices, build their business, win business, win work, do their marketing. Uh, and that's, that's what it is. And that's what's, we'll probably get there as well, but yep. that's the current Business card says. I don't know where it goes exactly from here, but we'll we'll see. How many years is you, have you been running this? Eight. Eight? Started in uh, February 2013. Crazy. So yeah, I guess if that math is right, it's past pretty, eight. It's pretty close. Yeah. Crazy. Um, you've obviously seen some episodes, so you kind of know my shtick. I like to take the guests back um, as far as they want to go. Yeah. And just and and what I like to do is just to kind of build a foundation for, for essentially where you are today. I know a little bit about your background, but um, yeah, I'd love for you just to kind of go back and, and talk about just how you grew up, what inspired you um, on the athletic side, because I know that was a big piece of your world. So yeah, yeah. just, just kind of go back and we'll get into it. And I'm just going to interject and make you stumble all over the place. Yeah, yeah, do it. Stop when there's, <laughs> there's more questions. No questions at the end. The, uh, I was thinking about it. And again, they say watching, watching these things, thinking it, it goes back, born and raised. Calgary, a Northwest boy. Uh, but I think is if I really look at the butterfly effect or in like this world of contact tracing, right? If we go yeah. all the way back to where it started, I think it was on the ski hill and really reflecting it. Grew up skiing, ski fam. Parents were skiers. Yeah. Found our way when I think I was around six-ish into the Mount Norquay Ski Club, skiing Nancy Green. Pretty grassroots, organic like not like it is now it's like moms and dads were the coaches and you know kind of just mm -hmm. figured it out like almost like community soccer is like yep. you know parents help and uh did that and grew up skiing that way every sunday got into it and uh did that through till you maxed out at nancy green was 12. Hmm. and i had the good birthday for sports i'm february baby and everything was december 31st so yeah. i guess it was until i was like 11. um skied and then once Nancy Green, that end of the road comes, it's like, well, for you, it would be hockey, right? Yep. You stop playing community hockey, going to quadrant hockey and yep. stuff. So then it's called class racing. And the names and titles have changed a little bit over the years. But for me, it was like J3, J2, J1. Now it's the simple U14, U16, U18. Gotcha. And uh, so I started doing that and then got into, you know, take the decide, do I want to continue with this or not? So you know, I like 18. So you were like skiing very competitive from you 14, 16, 18? Yeah. So you come out at Nancy Green, you decide if you want to go further or not. So we, we did. And, and, you know, we're into it by that point. Like I'd started on six, so I was six years or more into this. So we decide, you sign to see it through the, the growing up in the club of continuing on. So you carry on into J3 or U14 as a 12 and 13 year old. So start doing that. And that's when, that's when things get more serious right yeah. now you're skiing back then again out saturday sundays maybe start dipping a toe to tuesdays or thursdays or yeah. both at cop so you start skiing a, a, a bunch more yep 
start traveling and start doing the races and, and it looking back and again this is the stuff you, you don't pick up on until you're older wiser getting mm -hmm. reflected like mm -hmm. at the time it's just like we're just here skiing we're here racing we're doing our thing but then you start looking back now you have your own kids and stuff and programs like it's the real life lessons were yeah. almost like everything not ski related yeah again different time right we're talking like 30 years ago now where there's we're not worrying about the things we worry about now so it's class racing all the kids would ski together right so i'm, I'm not many all the kids it's like all the different programs and there was team vans and stuff which now for all sorts of liability and crazy reasons you don't put kids off into vans but it's mm -hmm. like we get dropped off. Folks would drop me off at uh, COP or at the Alberta Alpine office at COP and pile into vans. So it'd be the J3s, J2s, J like older guys yep. if they're around. Just all mash into one. Yeah, like into those like 12 or 15 Those airport vans. shuttles. Yeah, skis on the roof, <laughs> gates on the roof. And it's like, see you later, like bang the doors and you're gone. And it's like, yeah, we'll be back at, you know, 5, 5.30 yep. or whatever. So then it's like, shit, this is when things mm -hmm here you are like the 12 13 year old kid sitting in a van with mm -hmm. 16 17 yep. maybe the, you know hardcores that are still chasing it there at 18s and it's like that's when you quickly realize this isn't going skiing with mom and dad mm -hmm. and having like mm -hmm. hot chocolate mm -hmm. and gummy bears on the way home this is like you're getting your ears blown off with exposure to crazy music yep. crazy conversations and yep. you're like you know you learn really quick in hindsight when to like shut up and mm -hmm. speak up and, mm -hmm. and what to do. And you, you kind of quickly learn like Lord of the Flies rules of the jungle there on how it all works. Do you, were you, were you good? Like when you're, you, when you're in that van, did you stack up with everybody? Oh yeah. Yeah. But, and, I, and did that, did that allow you to connect better with the older people? When they look at you as like a kid that can perform, does that give you a, a little longer leash? It does eventually. Um, you know, cause you come in there, in your first years and you're just like, you don't know what's going on. You, as a, like, there was, there's no Google, like you can't Google what these guys are talking about. Yeah. Like, what did he just do? And what did he say <laughs> happened with his, you know, at yeah. this party or whatever. And, and so like, you're kind of figuring stuff out. So you just kind of fly on the wall and then, yeah, you ski and as y'all train together, or maybe, you know, some of the older guys are training on one run and you're on another, but yeah. then for different reasons, like you'll, start to cross train with each other and then they can see like, yeah, who's, yep. who's who. And, you know, if I look back, always been the big guy. I'm two years younger than my brother, but I think by the time we were eight or 10, like I was bigger than he oh, you're was. you're oversized all the time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like most definitely. Like I'm now, where I am now is probably where I've been since I was like 15, no way. 14 years old. Yeah, you're like, just like, you, at an early age you were. Yeah, hmm. yeah, so by, First year, U14, you kind of get it all figured out. Second year is when things start to get a little more real. And, and for me, that's where, again, hard to pontificate like or guess 30 years later what could have, should have been. Yep. But that was the year, you know, if I do look, there's, there's, a, there's an asterisk there and there's a footnote of a, you know, big crash, big accident. I'm not going to say like life, but career, you yep. know, ski world changing. So yep. it was... You know, I was prepping for this. And I was looking back. It's like it was uh, 1992, February 1992. So second year, 14. I was still 13 at the time. Was about to turn 14. And that's now. There's this kind of trio of, of races, and there's like Western Canadian Juvenile Championships, and then from there, you know, a bunch of kids would either pick or get qualified, and then go off to to national juvenile championships and then then the final stop was like Topolino which is like the world game like that's Italy and that's yep. like that's in, insanity that's like guys go from Topolino to like the World Cup and like be studs yep so, so that was you no well, not, <laughs> not quite but <laughs> you're going there flashes <laughs> glimpse right so, so you go through it and, and again you, you know who's who in the zoo but you get starting to get identified so yeah bigger guy and mm -hmm. skiing's a gravity sport so yep. that helps right with being a bigger dude comes strength and all these other things so you know, we were at this camp at, at Lake Louise, um, in, which was a, a kind of a prepping towards this selection committee for Western Canadians and nationals and, and then who knows what. And this, this is funny because, again, thinking and, and really forcing me to reflect on this once you, you invited me here was the schedule really hasn't changed. Like the World Cups pre COVID or whatever, World Cup season always starts in Louise because mm -hmm. they got huge snowmaking and the rest. So it's like World Cup is November, December. 
And then in January is the NORAM circuit. So that's the North American crew. Mm -hmm. That's the U.S. guys, development teams, et cetera, maybe some NCAA studs and, you know, a few guys from Europe will go back and forth, yep. right? Like NHL is the show, then you got the A, yep. and then you got all sorts of crazy Euro League. So there's a Europa Cup circuit too. So those guys roll through and they ski the same track. Like they spend insane money building that track out for the World Cup. So then they leverage yep. the hell out of it. So norams roll through and then it turns into you know provincial teams or national teams may stick around and train for a little bit and then the alberta cup circuit rolls through which is guys from alberta bc all the older dudes yep. would, would ski race there and then we were tailing on to that so then the main race series roll through so now it's like we have the the track for our, our training for this camp on this on a crazy yeah crazy like you're, hill, you're right? not starting from the world cup start but you're starting you're skiing like you're skiing the majority of it. Yeah. Like it's, you know, maybe gates have been placed slightly different spots, but you're, you're still flying. Like we were still skiing at well over a hundred K an hour and, and doing all sorts of stuff on like the, the bulletproof snow. So you're, you're there, like it's, yeah. it's legit. It's, it's legit as you can get. Yeah. And uh, in the afternoon of, of the second day, you know, big fall, like huge fall. Skiing, coming down, same parts you see on TV, down, coach's corner around there through this place called gun barrel it's this big left-hander i don't really remember much of this because this has all been now told yep. many times because you're ko'd or what yeah yeah so come around this this sweepy left-hander and come around the corner my left ski comes off turning left so inside ski comes off and then all sorts of bad things cartwheels mm -hmm. tumbles mm -hmm. knocked out uh wake up and and i do remember this is when i i wake up i have to name drop a, a few here so <laughs> wake up and uh one of the first things i remember is this guy urs walliser he's still around he's a swiss ski team stud he still coaches at panorama <laughs> to this day u16 coach there but he comes over and doesn't quite tackle me down but like certainly is like here when i wake up all mangled and kind of lays me back down is like whoa whoa like we don't need to yeah take your time yeah, take yeah, your breath right. here and uh, again, feeling, I don't know if I was out for, for seconds or minutes or whatever, but long enough where I know my coaches were up on coach's corner watching. So another name drop who's going to come back into the story a while later, Todd uh, McNutt was my coach. And from where he was standing to where when I woke up, I see him kind of pulling in would be yep. a while to yep. ski down, not minutes, but like certainly more than five yeah, seconds come, yeah, away. Yeah. So he, he comes skiing down and starts ralphing in the on the side of the course and uh i go to sit up and then it's like no no lay down lay down and then all of a sudden toboggans are coming and mm -hmm. the, the ski patrollers are coming and what had happened through the whole washing machine of the fall is my right knee turning left somehow landed or pile drived onto the left ski that had come off so it was like axe wound in the <laughs> knee and we kind of CSI that together <laughs> later because when you put the skis and you put stuff together, there's like yeah. bits and mm -hmm. you know, souvenirs on the ski. So that's like, you know, get wrapped up, get tobogganed, hit the ambulance, go to Lake Lou or into Banff, Mineral Springs. And uh, this is this is like, it's funny because the ski patrollers, like it's probably like a guy like you or I would have been. He's doing it for the... Mm -hmm for the free pass yeah for sure and now he's got he's like deal a, with you. he's got like a legit yeah he's got like a legit <laughs> trauma on it so the way that that the ski hit the leg is kind of axe wound and kind of pulled it opened it to the inside well when they wrapped up all the gauze and stuff mm -hmm. they wrapped it closed what that means is when they unwrapped it all in mineral springs they just pulled everything wide open again right so i remember that when they like okay let's take a look at this so You're instead of you're 14? 13. Thir so this is like trauma, trauma. 13. Oh, yeah. This is like legit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they cut. Instead of cutting the bandages off, they just like decide to unwrap it. And as they unwrap it, they like open they, the, they the peeled you open. wound again. And that like sits me up. And I remember seeing the knee. I'm like, wow, like bones are really white. <laughs> and there is lots of stuff there. Um, so then it's like, yeah, we this is bad. We can't deal with this. So they back into the ambulance. We go go back to Calgary, folks meet at the children's, the old children's hospital. And then that's just starts the whole thing about, yeah, cutting everything off. I still yeah. had uh, a boot on, I had downhill suit on, which they had to cut off. And uh, that probably pissed you off, hey? Well, I pissed my dad off a lot. Because like, of expensive suit? Well, well, it was a cool suit. Like it was, <laughs> yeah. so that's the era, right? It was a 
names, if there's any skiers, it was Heidi Zerbergen. Like, so through from the 88 games, right? Yeah. There's lots of people that left gear behind and yeah. traded stuff. So through a roundabout way, I got this, this Swiss Olympic suit <laughs> awesome. that I was wearing. So it gets cut off and uh, into surgery I go and then spend two weeks, 10 plus days in the hospital rehabbing and fighting infection and bone stuff. Like, yep. you know, bones aren't meant to be hit with yep. dirty wax that force. skis yeah, yeah. and things. So that was right around, um, and I remember this because Albertville Olympics were starting. So I was, here I am laid up in the hospital. At least I'm getting to watch um, Albertville Olympics in the hospital and then stayed there, had the visits. And uh, again, in this weird butterfly effect, this is sort of where like the, the cycling came. But anyway, yeah. recover from that and uh, don't know, right? Doctors like, we don't know, like maybe you'll ski again, maybe you won't, maybe you will, but not at that level. So, you know, do the rehab. Which is tough to hear at that age, right? <clears throat> like to be, to be 13, I'm sure you're like, you're kind of yeah, all you know, in on skiing, you're passionate about skiing and all of a sudden somebody's telling you that this, you might not be able to do it yeah, at the you level. You don't know what that means though. Like you, you don't have the life experience through it. You're like, whatever, no, like this guy, sure. Like he's a doctor, but he doesn't know me. Yeah. At, at times like, okay, I won't ski again. Other times like, no, I can totally do this. So yeah. spend the rest of the winter, um, getting better and rehabbing. And then it was that August, uh, had to decide, am I going to, can I ski again? So we went to summer ski camp at Whistler, which was cool. Yep. Right. Like that was, you're up on the glacier, mm -hmm. you're August, you're in the village in shorts, you ride whatever, two, three chair lifts up, yep. starts getting into cold and snow. And then you're at the top of the glacier and you're, you're skiing, like you're, you're skiing on snow. And, and even then was like, wow, this is from a, a pure life experience. Like you're yep. looking that way and there's all sorts of world cup heroes and hall of famers and national teams that way. And then other, you know, spoiled punks like me, there trying to you yep. know, figure things out and I'm there trying to basically just see if I can ski figure it. Yeah. My dad's like, well, we're not going to read, like, we're not going to register. We're not going to like, we need to mm -hmm. figure out what's happening, um, for the following season. So go there. And that was a, a cool life experience, but able to ski, able to salvage it. Um, you know, didn't make it to any of those, those other big races that year, obviously yep. those guys that are at the camp take off and go do their thing. Um, but then come back, train, rehab and start skiing again. So then I was like first year J2, first year U16, which is you moving up another weight class. So you go from being like, could have been yep. kind of the king, you know, winning races, being, you know, top, one of the top guys in that U14 world yep. into like, okay, now I'm back. Now I'm the, the 14 young, year old the young guy. with the guys who could be turning 16 this yep. year. And again, that's still, a, I was a big dude, but that's still two years of For sure. like it's a big difference maturity in yep. and size and skill. And so you start from the bottom and you, you chug along still skied well, had a bunch of, you know, decent results, you know, get some medals along the way, win some things, get invited to some camps, do some stuff, but it was never, didn't quite ever close that gap, right? Yep. Like you lost some of that head start. And then you carry on into those final, and then you go up to that last weight class or J1, or now it's just called FIS. Like that's, that's it. Yeah. That's like open league. Like it, there's no age like no like well around here yes but once you start going to like the provincial races yep. or like u.s region like now now it's it's, it's yeah like that's that's the you know federation international the ski like that's that's the global standard so it's any fist race it's like going into the show you could be yep. a 16 year old stud playing against 41 year old mm -hmm. patrick marlowe and like it's different right yeah, yeah. so you go and you, again you're the 14 16 year old kid being like yeah i'm kind of a local i can do this i'm a local stud <laughs> yeah in yeah canada maybe i'm start, you know always a top five always a top 10 guy maybe i'll win one here or there in in alberta and then it's like I remember you go to the, some of those races so there's one at, at the start of the season uh nikiska is always a big place right where mm -hmm. again snowmaking and national teams show up so one year they do this early season slalom race there and there is legit like Mark Giardelli was there. The dude's won a hundred world cup races, like a five time overall world cup winner, like has won races in every discipline. And he's there cause he's here training. So mm -hmm. he's going to race. So now it's like, you're in the lodge, you pick up your bib and you're like, well, I'm 181 or something. And normally you're like, I'm usually used to being like eight or 12. Or so. so now it's like, there's like 160 <laughs> dudes going to ski this course before I get a chance to even like try and survive this thing. Like that's, that's the wake up call you get when yeah. you're like, well, it's, this is like big league. And then you everywhere. It's like 
Does that you, slow you down though? Does that, you know, was there, was there a moment where you were kind of, um, you know, when you get outside of your bubble and the bubble is Calgary, Western Canada, whatever it is, yeah. and you can do your thing. And then do, when you get into a, a, a bigger fishbowl, what is it, what does it feel like? Does well, it, do you question things or are you like losing motivation or is it, does it, does it, amp you up to get going yeah well there's a few things that when you again at the time you're like oh yeah i'm gonna go there i'm gonna try and hang and then you quickly realize you're like this is not this is not you're, happening this is for all sorts of reasons right yeah but it changes and it's a kudos to and i've told other people this with have kids through the programs and stuff now but it's a kudos to and i was blessed again looking back i was blessed with some incredible coaches and things to work with like todd mcnutt there an Olympian, you know, just missed out on the 88 games. Cyclist, yeah. Yeah. right? Arguably better cyclist than skier. He's a provincial team ski guy back in the day. And then he was a uh, road race, had a professional road riding career. So no stranger. Um, another coach that I had, still buddy to this day, Brian McLennan, Big Mac, like a national team alumni guy. Um, so like, his claim to fame would be in 89, he went to World Juniors and was seventh at World Juniors for, for downhill. Yep. So this is like early 90s when I had the crash. So he's not really that far removed, yep. right? So he's like obviously four or five years away from his own touching on the World Cup. And yep. it's like those guys, it's like, okay, we're here at this race or we're here in Jackson Hole, we're doing these races. Dude, like this isn't about winning anymore. This mm -hmm. is about, you have to change your focus. It's about challenging yourself. And that's weird. Because, Which is different, right? Well, and it's, it's for like skiing. It's like you're always challenging yourself, but you're still racing the field. Like who gets the fastest time? Yep. Now it's like. It really doesn't. Dose of reality, man. Like there's nothing you can do mm -hmm. that's going to even challenge these yeah. guys because they're A, grown men. Like there's a bunch of, yep. you know, other experience factors here. Like so now it just comes down to like you racing you, you doing you, which kind of at the time, again, you don't really comprehend, but now later in life, you really look back at that and be like, that's what it was. It was challenging yeah. yourself to, can you train? Can you put in the best efforts? Can you do yourself, you know, proud and justice as opposed to just, you know, going through the motions. Yeah. So, so it changed, right? So yeah, you think, you don't know what you're in for until you're there. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, this is what they mean. So does that, when you, when you realize that, you have that moment of like, oh, this is, yeah. this is now where I stack up. Is that, is that the beginning of the end? Do you start slowing down or what, like what happens? Yeah. So I skied, came back that first year after the crash that came back that first year was, a uh, going through the motions. Let's just see what happens. And then it was second year J2 or second year U16 where we're kind of closing some, see, have back having better results. And then, you know, though, like you've been around long enough to know that if you're going to make that jump yep. to fit, like, unless you are a true stud. Yep it's like you're just going for your own personal reasons yep. like and you just love it and yeah and again like thinking back on it it's not like when you make that jump from six yeah your skills are going to improve you might get it but you're not going to be like mm -hmm. at the end of the year another heads and shoulders even better than you were at the start of the year yep. like your, your skiing will kind of plateau but it's all these other stuff that comes on right can you perform under pressure can yep. you do your best to prepare and challenge yourself and and go through that type of a, of a process is much different than when you're younger. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm here to win this. Yeah, when podium. Think I can. Like, yeah, right? Your, your goals completely change. Yep. But again, I don't know how much of that, if I were to take the time machine back and, and know how much of my 16, 17-year-old self was really yep. there. That being said, at the end of grade 11, um, I knew it's like, there was other, you know, minor crashes and bumps and injuries along the way. And you're kind of like, this isn't quite going where we need it yep. to go. And at the same time, right, academics and career and school are also there. So what were you thinking? That, how, are you, how are you balancing that? Were you a good student? Not bad. Like pretty good, right? Like, and, like, and this is another interesting part where you look back at the story and then there's so many lessons here. So I went to normal junior high and you just miss what you miss. But then grade 10... I moved over to Bishop Carroll, like the original sports school. Oh yeah. Like the, the yeah, country yeah. club. Yeah. And, uh, so grade 10, I skied like 120 plus some days, probably missed at least half of those were school days that yeah. I missed. Uh, and then same thing, grade 11 was like 140 some odd days missing probably 60, 70 days of school. Yep. But that was the place to do it. Like, For sure. um, you were allowed to, <laughs> you were allowed, but you're also <laughs> surrounded by 
Yeah. Like there was no like Coda Sports School is just starting up, but there was no edge school. There's nothing else. So like yeah. it was either feeder school to small number of kids, mm-hmm. and then there was like the other like kind of I don't know, not the right word, but just a mishmash of people who went there because it was yep. self studied. Yep. And then there was a huge probably more than half the population at that time were athletes. Yep. Like name dropping and like Curtis Maiden was there and Joanne Millar and um Haley Wickenheiser and I went to junior high together and went to Bishop Carroll together and there's all these other you know national team swimmers and mm-hmm. Jason Butchney was a national team track cyclist at the time like so that you're surrounded by dudes who are like in their school newsletter it's like yep. oh Joanne Millar just won world championships or whatever so when you see those guys yep it was no fooling around. Like the locals who was their feeder school would be the ones outside playing hacky sack mm-hmm. and like not doing anything. Yep. Whereas it was these other hardcore athletes, Olympians, people were like, they were there, they were there studying hard, writing tests because it's, then they were gone for yep. a month or whatever, yep. right? So you, again, through osmosis, and maybe that's part of just, you know, so I comment about sitting in the ski van, no one to sit up and shut up. Like yep. you quickly learn yep. how to do it who's doing this yeah. and how it works. Do you feel normal? Did it feel normal then? <clears throat> you know, as a kid, you know, if I, if I run it back for any kid to miss, you know, that much time in high school, it's kind of a weird thing. But when you're in yeah. that, when you're in that environment, it just feels natural, right? So then it, does it free you up to just continue to go after it and not really overthink it? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it, it feels normal when you're in that environment, because again, those are the guys you're hanging with. And that's yeah. what you know. And there's lots of other guys that were skiers and maybe not on the same team, but you know, other clubs and stuff yep. were there. So you'd see him in school, you'd see him at the races, we yep. traveled together. But compared to the other friends who didn't go yeah. to that school, yeah, it's like, it's hey, weird. we're having a party. Yeah, I'm, I'm gone. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm on the road for 12 days. Like, mm-hmm. oh, we're having a birthday party. It's yeah. like, no, I won't be there because <laughs> I'll be in <laughs> Roslyn or I'll be in some small <laughs> ski town somewhere in a hotel, right? And it, it, that, so that part, you, you quickly realize even then it's like, well, you're not my friend during winter kind of deal because yeah, you're just not around. Gone, like we'll yeah. see you in the spring. Yeah. And that, so that, you, you know, you're smart enough then to know that that's not normal compared yeah, it's, to... It's way different. And even skiing that much, like it's, it's a lot. Of, For sure. Right? Like, that's a big commitment at a young age. Yeah. All right. So, you know, you know at that point that's not, not normal. So then do you finish grade 12 skiing or when does the ski career kind of wrap no, up? ski career officially hung them up at the, at the end of uh, the grade 11 season and then decided like I don't want to be left behind i don't want to do the four year or three and a half year yep. thing so i the bishop carroll classic four and a half yeah well, okay. or four three and a half, three and a half whatever, whatever, whatever it is and finish at van horn or wherever or <laughs> chinook college at the time yeah so i uh, grade 12 buckled down hard i wrote six diplomas in grade 12 which at, was at carroll still yeah okay yeah stayed there um and just went nuts like just crushed out stuff and, and you were school was like easy for you were you like it wasn't easy i mean you always struggle with with some stuff no, no. but i i, I struggle <laughs> yeah, no. when, pe- when people say you always struggle i'm like no 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 <laughs> no, no I, I i was a good student um but i think it was because of all those other like habits you learn yeah and i can with any any elite i don't know many high-end high-functioning people that uh or sorry, that aren't athletes or don't have some experience like that. Like lots, lots of the athletes I did know and high functioning athletes turned into be pretty successful people because yep. they know how to get shit done. Yeah, and dig in. And- yeah, so it was like still grade 12, maybe some of those buds wrote one or two diplomas in grade 11 and had, but it's like, no guys, I need to do this. So it's like, well, last year you're all like traveling skiing and you won't come party now this year. You know, you won't come it's party because you're studying. It's like, well, guys, I'm trying to close the gap. So that, yeah, I, I worked hard grade 12. I, that was, it was a grind, like yep. going three and three. I don't know what kids do nowadays, but it felt like, as far as I'm concerned, it felt pretty, felt pretty difficult in grade yep. 12. Um, but then was, was moving on. And that, yeah, that kind of closed the book on the ski thing. And it was weird. And I don't know why I'd have to doctor fill it or something, but I didn't ski for... For the next 10 years, I bet he skied five times. Crazy. Isn't that so wild? Yeah. It is a Dr. Phil. I'm definitely not qualified to even start this conversation yeah. with you. No, but like other friends are like, let's go. I'm like, I don't want to go skiing. Like, I'm done. Like, I, right? Because it's, it's different, right? It was just yeah. different. I don't know if I was pissed. I don't know if I was like subconsciously just didn't want to do it anymore. It's all, I think it's all of it. Maybe. I think it's like. Probably. It's, you know, it's. Um, could be like jealousy of somebody that you skied with that's still doing it. It could be the, yeah. just straight burnout. It could be. I think uh, so interests you know and like yeah at a young age it's tough to deal with all that because um 
when it's all consuming. Yeah. And it stops. So, so after you graduate, are you, did you go to university and when did you start working? Yeah. Well, well, I was also like pretty motivated that way. Um, first job ever was related to skiing through ski stuff. It was like loading equipment in and out of the old Max Bell ski sale. Yeah. yeah. But that was for like, you know, a couple 50 yeah. buck bills and like, it, there was no like <laughs> ROE or, you know, T4 required. So that was like cash. First real job was at the golf course, scrubbing clubs and doing that. But that was only for back a shop. couple, yeah, back shop for a couple of years. But it was, uh, and this is part of that, that weird continuity part. It was really got down to biz around 15, started working at Bo Cycle in the store, right? And that even came through. This is weird. Cause you know, this is, <clears throat> you know, our family's known each other for a long time with, our, with my bro and, and yeah, so I, I don't, I knew you worked there, but I'm really, I'm really curious to hear about the, uh, this, this, okay. this shift, this shift in your, like, yeah. what you were up to. Okay. So, so this is how I've truly pieced this together over the years. Cause people always ask is, uh, laying in that hospital in February. So Olympics were on, but in February for any of the uh, Olympic fans out there in 92, it was always winter and summers are in the same year, right? Yep. So 92 were Barcelona summer games. Now previously mentioned, Coach McNutt there uh, was heading off to those Barcelona games as part of the national road cycling team. He was in the, the team, tri- team time trial at uh, those 92 games. So he was only at Louise kind of like sliding around helping coach, but like, yeah. I don't want to get hurt. And that yeah. was also a different era, right? That speaks to those are true like amateur mm-hmm. athletes. Like yeah. he had a winter job ski coaching and then Heart. he was going to leave that early to go join the Canadian Olympic team to go do the final prep for the game. Best of the best. Yeah. Like it's not like, it wasn't like it is now where it's like you're dedicated, like he had 12 months. other jobs. Right. So, so he comes to the hospital in uh, 90 in February, but that previous summer, 91, he was national road champ. Like he won the national road no race in, uh, in Canada. So he was riding professionally in the summers. And so he brings me, he basically comes and says like, get your ass on a bike, like start training. I'm leaving now, but we'll see you in the fall and brings me a Jersey from his team, which was called Evian Miko, which is like a Canadian pro team, Evian water and Miko chocolate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Klondike bars. And, uh, gives me some of his Oakley sunglasses, a couple team shirts, a vest. And like, he's like, you know, leaves me this care package and, and I'm like, okay. So then, and I'd always ridden bikes. Like everyone yeah. rides bikes, had BMX bikes, different mountain bikes, but it was always like, we we're going to ride the bikes to the park. We we're going to ride yeah. our bikes to our friend's house to jump on the trampoline. Yeah. Slurpees. So that summer was really the first, I'm going to go ride a bike to try and build muscle on my leg. Like before it was always like a ripple, a spinoff effect, right? Yeah. Like a residual, yeah. the fact that you rode your bike to six different friends house. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you got fit along the way. was a bonus. Yeah. Now it's like, I'm leaving my driveway to go ride up and down home road, or I'm going to go ride somewhere to try and build my yeah. muscle. So that was the first summer of actually riding. So now you do that, you start popping tires, start breaking shit. And all of a mm-hmm. sudden there's the local bike store, right? Mm-hmm. Going down a bow to get something fixed or something adjusted. And then, you know, they knew from growing up in the Northwest and buying bikes, like you're yep. a ski guy and yep. you've had an accident and here's how it goes. And so start seeing, you know, Bry in there and, mm-hmm. and now breaking stuff. It's like, well, I want these. Well, and I don't even know how I, where I would have got this level of like, confidence or something. Was, I remember asking him like, well, I should just start working here and then I'll get a staff discount when I have to buy all this stuff. <laughs> and Brian's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Right? It makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah. It was good logic. A bit right? of an ask. Yeah. Like I need, oh, okay. If I keep breaking this bike or mild out this one, I should just buy a new one, but I, I should get a job here before I buy the new one. And it kind of laughed it off. But then, so that was like summer 14th. So by the next summer, uh, I was hired there at 15 in 1993 yep. to start working there as the shop tow rag. Just do whatever. Yeah, like sweeping crap up, yep. putting garbage away, like yep. just do, maybe sell a bell or whatever, yeah, like yeah, but yeah. just general. Just be around. Toe ragging, yeah, yep. like that. That and then then it snowballed into, you know, maybe working in P and A land, so selling helmets or you know, someone would sell a bike and they'd be like, hey, I got another customer, like yeah, go go sell them a helmet or, yep. or get their water bottle, their stuff, and, and you know, get a bike checked over, sell them a patch kit, whatever, and then it snowballed into you know parts and accessories sales and then into worked on the sales floor for a while and then into the service shop and 
then into well into university i had a semester off because the courses didn't line up with that whole shit yep. show so then i was running the service department for a winter no way um you know then back onto the sales floor like then just there and yep. then and, you know and that that store is a little bit different because that's the prior gen yep. store right yep. where the further down the street than the one is now yeah, this, this is like the original carpet going up the stairs yeah. like yeah, yeah. high end villa yeah, upstairs yeah, totally. and then yeah. the, the kind of center island in the middle yeah there. all the bikes hanging down low yeah. <laughs> yeah so that was it so that's when i started i started working there at 15 and Crazy. then then just charged it through and it was ew fuck that was aw- that was the best time all the way through university too yeah and so like part-time hours yeah well, it was good like, it worked well for you know bry because he's just he's a genius at, at this kind of stuff figured out all my regular dudes so all the hall of famers that were there as the, the core guys they work in sano in the summer so in the winter they need a bit of a breeze so i'd be mm. also going to school so it was high school i'd work friday afternoons or like from four till yep. close yep. and then i'd work saturday sundays all through the winter and those guys would have days off and interesting they'd, they'd work every other saturday or every other sunday but i'd be there all the time yep. so doing kind of relief hours through the winter and then again in the summer it'd, all hands on deck, right? Because yep. it's just, you can't get enough help. Yep. And then, so that was all the way through high school and then into uni, working there, you know, saving and doing stuff for all sorts of different roles and, yep. and, and jobs and, and getting involved. And, you know, that's when you that's when you look back, That's that was the school of hard knocks where I learned mm. so much about life and business. And it's similar, right? Because again, in that ski van, when I'm the 14 year old with the 17, 18 year olds, yep. now I'm the 15 year old with a bunch of 30, 40 year olds. Mm-hmm. Like again, mm-hmm. that's also when a lot of life <laughs> lessons took, did took you, place. Did you have the personality to actually shut up? You're, uh, you're, you're a bit of a mouthpiece. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering how tolerant they were of you or, or what, when you actually came no, out of your I shell. Can read, I, can read a, I can read a room a little <laughs> bit because again, you just don't know. Like you're, you're confident in your own circles until you get into there and you start yeah. realizing like again, like, wow, I thought I could sell something, yeah. but I didn't realize I had to sell to seven different people at once because yeah. the store is so busy, yeah. right? Like, or I, I thought I was pretty knowledgeable until someone comes in and says, how do I fix this? And I'm yeah. like, oh, I don't know, right? Dial so then friend. it's like, um, yeah, Fransky, how do we do this <laughs> or whatever, right? So, so then, you, then again, like you quickly realize, <laughs> think you know, mm-hmm. to what you don't know, yeah. and then it just starts learning. But yeah. that was the apprenticeship of a lifetime for... Well, the, all of that stuff, life skills, business yep. skills, retail, marketing, consumer, uh, leadership, all yep. of that stuff was trial by fire. Again, whether it's obvious, it was more obvious at the time yep. than like some of the, the ski lessons were because you're getting older and you're hopefully a little bit wiser. But and how many years were you there? Ten. A decade. Yeah, a decade of excellence. Crazy. Well, it, it was so it was all the way through from like 15, 93 till there's a slight sabbatical in there. Yep. So I, I finished off university and thought I had to do what good university kids do is, you know, go get corporate job. And yep. so I finished off and, and left and went and tried. What was, your, what was your degree? Commerce. Okay. Marketing and, and commerce degree. Yep. Uh, from UFC. So go way downtown, get a couple shitty like really First, shitty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we're, like wearing a shitty 90s um, suit or like khaki pants and an oversized yeah. t-shirt? Yeah, golf shirt, oversized golf shirt. Just like horrible. Sleeves down here, horrible. maybe maybe two or three khaki <laughs> pleats on the front. Horrible. Yeah, 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 terrible, terrible. So well, I'm even going to say, like, the names of the guilty are withheld, but, like, one of them was a cold caller for a headhunting agency. Oh, yeah. Just dialing the phone, asking like, "Hi, a client is looking for a she is horrible. veterinarian. Like, horrible. do you know anybody who might be here?" So yeah, how awful. long did you last? Oh, like eight months in there. And then what? You go crawling back? Yeah, I boomeranged it, and it was a it was a certain like I had never officially left way downtown because I was still involved, or le- never left you know downtown Bonas as we called it. Never yeah. really left because I was still connected with the cycling team and the race team that we were you know so, so I was still racing bikes now at that point right okay. Went from from ski racing to bike racing. And, so still connected to the store, and yep. that's when it was 2099, 2000. Um, t- started discussing the family, Sibthor family, was thinking about piecing off the motor motorcycle dealership. Yep. And now ground was being laid to build what is the current store or the yep. new store at the time, right? Yep. So started chatting with Bry and you know laughing about how way downtown was going for me. So then in 2000, <laughs> I went back. No, it'd be after that. 
dates are getting fuzzy. Be after graduation, after uni. Yep. So it's been like, oh, two uh, went back officially for a two year, two year contract or two year role. Yep. Uh, was the original commitment. Maybe it was going to extend, maybe it wouldn't, but it was, it was going to be commit to two years to do two things. Help Bri on the front end or Bri and Jimmy open up the new store. Yep. So there's lots of, you know, process, planning, yep. strategy stuff, brand stuff, marketing stuff. You're, stuff you're into it? Yeah. Like like that was like Bri said, like, you're the only guy here who's actually learned anything about this from like a textbook as opposed to, to them. Yeah. Um, which again, their, their knowledge would still help piece, pace me 10 to 1. But yep. So I go back there doing that, and that's also the same time when, when Brian and Jimmy were selling off the, the motor dealer. So they wanted a piece of transitional, you know, kind of their blood, so to speak, helping transition in the new owners yep. working on the floor. So I was on doing double duty, work and call it, you know, bull cycle general with some st time on the, on the bike side and some yep. time on the motor side. And, yep. and then the motor side was cool. That was learning uh, dealership life, right? Like it's not retail anymore. Mm -hmm. Like that's dealership world, which is different from retail mm -hmm. world. So you yep. learn that. And did you ever ride? Did you ever get a bike? Oh yeah, I got the light. Like Jimmy, Jimmy was like, "Yeah, you need to get a license." Like, yeah, yeah. Brian Bri was like, "I don't care." Jimmy was, was like, "Yeah, you got to ride." So first thing was like, ship me off to Too Cool Motor School, yep. and grab the license and, and rode. And yeah, like, that was fun. Did you, you have a bike? Do you remember your first bike? I didn't need Motorbike? a bike. I had the, like you just could take loaners uh, out. Yeah, or, demo or, or like the the used trade-in yeah, stuff. Yeah. Like that was the so you didn't deal. need one. No, no. It's like you want to ride that that one weekend you want to ride that home tonight and bring it back tomorrow like cool. they they didn't care that would have been my because I, I bought my first bike when i was 19. it was an 89 yamaha 750 virago red and white oh super cherry <laughs> and i bought it off, i bought it off jimmy <clears throat> and and i remember uh i was i was 19 when i bought this thing and i didn't have a license i had the i think i had my learners so I can't remember how I got it home. But anyways, I got it home. Mom and dad. Just mom did mom it. was not impressed. Yeah, of course. Mom, mom no was mom is. She was like, you need to get you need to get a job and get a vehicle. Okay. You didn't say what kind of vehicle. Check. <laughs> so anyways, I bought, I bought a bike from Jimmy. So I couldn't imagine. If I would have had the opportunity to just take bikes home at, at a whim, I would have been. Yeah. Yeah, candy, candy same store. deal. So all sorts of those same stories pull up. And yep. mom's like, what the? Where's what the is car? this? Oh, I left the dad's <laughs> store. What if I ride this home tonight? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that was a, a, a hoot, right? And even yep. like think back, like we would have cro crossed paths there. For right? sure, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was where, no, well, <laughs> specifically, do you remember? Mm -hmm. That, that totally. Race City? Yeah. The Canadian yeah, Superbike yeah. Series? Totally. Like, so we were doing that, right? That was just, that's that's another part of the, the cool, fun thing, right? Like, So we had Chris Paris, local hero, right? Was riding Canadian Superbike Series and had a cup of tea with like Honda Aryan America there and Superbike and MotoGP chasing that dream but rolls through as like the local hero so we being the shop used to shop at wanted to do that vip event so yep. enter in dj jeff humphreys to come to come dust him off the top of uh race city speedway Rest pouring in rain peace. wasn't it yeah it was i was gonna pouring say just rain. pounded rain it like, was horrible you're, you're you hired you to play in front of like six people i was yeah, yeah was it was off with garbage bags over the speakers. Oh, sorry, that was ridiculous. And then I think eventually you're like, half we got to cut. Like, yeah, this is over. <laughs> I'm renting this There's gear. There's six and people. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> and like, these records aren't waterproof. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was no computers back then. No, no. Wheels of steel. So when you, so after, after your 10 years there, mm -hmm. then what do you do? Uh, well, then, well, so that comes to a, a forced realization of, you know, as much fun as that industry is and was and how much I still love it and look back on those years, it was the way my life was going and, you know, hanging with the other buds and personal life, you know, that, that business doesn't really have weekends, right? Yep. Whereas all the other guys I was hanging with and friends and um, girlfriend, now wife, all that stuff is like yep. working Monday to Friday. And it's like, hey, it's, we're going out to Invermere this weekend. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's cool. I'm going to work. My Saturday, Sunday is called Tuesday, Thursday, right? Like <laughs> yeah. those are my days off. Or yeah. maybe you get a Wednesday, Thursday in the middle of the week. Um, you know, so, so all of a sudden you start looking at that going, hmm, I don't know if I want to play this game forever. So then I realized that's when, you know, I'll try and go back, you know, to find something else yep. more suitable to yep. call it the way my life was, was shaken out with, you know, friends and, and the rest of it, more of that Monday to Friday. Well, yeah, so then I go back downtown and, and work a, a couple different things and, and that's uh 
Did you did you enjoy working for somebody, or or, or when did you <clears throat> did you just do it because you had to do it, or did, was there starting to have thoughts creep into your head that you're like, you know what, I I need I need my thing, I need my my own thing. Like when do you start? When do no, you figure that, that out? No, that didn't come until uh, later. That didn't come until I, I launched Peak in in thirteen. But before that, I've always had little dabbles of my own thing yep. along the way. Not like I've had a number of companies or things, but like one example would be, so even through uni days and, you know, learning at the store. So now there's the bike team, right? And then you, so you're racing as part of the bike team and then, you, you know, a couple things happen that either tick you off or you don't agree with. Yep. And then it's like, well, you can either complain about it or you can do something about it. So yep. then who takes over as president of the bike club? Mm-hmm. Well, half half yep. does it i take it over and then so now now we grow that into something yep. and we, we apply lots of the well this is what we do for high level ski racing this is what you should high level cycling in, yep. in the, for this team and, and so ran that for two three years yep turn it into something so yeah I'm, I'm working at the store transitioning to downtown but at the same time what i'm really pumping in time and effort to is creating this cycling team building like, it out yeah team both cycle or both cycle republic was the team at the time both cycle republic yeah <laughs> yeah it was awesome it was, that was that was a, that was a hall of fame like so so you, you turn that into something right yeah and and then whether it was you know just organizing a mishmash of goofballs to go play men's league hockey it's yep. like someone yep. always needed the organizer so that was always me and like i'll organize were that. you always like that when you, th- um, when you think back, was it always, because I got a friend, I got a tall friend, Miles Nash, and he's just like, in our group of friends, he's the organizer. Yeah. And, and he's, he's always been like that, and he, he's really good at it. And I, I yeah. figure it's like, a, you got to be that guy early. I don't think you just flip a switch and you're that guy. No. No, no, I've always been. Yeah, because again, it's either through, I don't know if it's a, again, it, this is a Dr. Phil item. I don't know if it's a control your own by being an individual sport guy like yep. ski guy you can control your own yep. it's, it's on you so if yep. you don't like something about it fix it um but that was it like I, I didn't something could be better if i see something can be better i'll just do it yep and if it i've probably been guilty for sure stepping on someone's toes at the time yep. for being oh that i should have that was my job well you weren't doing it right so yeah. i, I kind of did I'm it for up. you <laughs> right so that was lots of of those years so that's always been um you know, had it. even like recently with the kids now getting into golf and organizing that so i've played like four years at our, at our club being the, the junior golf chair they're just organizing stuff because no one else would well mm-hmm. now i got skin in the game mm-hmm. like if i got skin in the game as a cyclist yeah as a skier as a ski dad or yep. as a golf dad and shit's not getting done well then i'll just do it yep. because because it it, selfishly it's going to benefit me and it's also ripple effect will benefit others so you just get it get it done and that's what, what that's why I say it's always been some element of doing my my own thing. Yep. I would argue that that's been there even when I was, you know, collecting paycheck from big multinational corp downtown thing. Yep. There was always some element of this little side passion project to do yep. thing that was super important to me or others around me. So when did you when did you decide to to go out on your own? What what that exit look like from like you know, the oversized golf shirts and khaki, khaki. Oh, uh, no, that, by that, then we were well into like, well, better, still, much more tailored It still clothing. wasn't great, was it? Much more tailored clothing. Uh, well, so I was, yeah, I was working at, uh, at KPMG as a national marketing manager for all the energy practice. So that's like, you know, I was there for seven years yep. playing marketing guy in, in a big accounting big space, firm. Yep. Um, but realizing with, uh, we had already had Kyle, my oldest one, and Cohen was... Shana was on, on mat leave. My wife was on mat leave with number two. And we're starting to figure out, like, she's got a big career. And I had a busy one, corporate guy. And we're trying to figure out, how does this make sense? Like, right now, we got mm-hmm. the kids shoved in daycare. Mm-hmm. And they come down with that. It was in our building. Like, they come oh, yeah. down. We drop them off at 7.30. Yeah. And we pick them up at 5.30. <sighs> but we also had the benefit of other, you know, older people with friends and, and kids in their lives that were like, yeah, when they go to school, kindergarten's like whatever, nine twenty one to eleven forty seven or mm-hmm. something stupid, and yep. and it was like, how are we going to make this work? So being, again, both kind of planner people, wife and I started figuring out how do we do this. Yep. And I said, well, so she's a, a CA and accountant. I said, well, you've worked, we've had these discussions. Like, 
we're not stopping. Like you've yeah. worked She's into your ass deep. off to, to get where you're at. And, yep. and maybe you've done these two mat leaves. So maybe it's only fair that I, you know, try and, and, yep. and do something. So, Cause she goes back right to her yep. legislated mandated, you know, company's got to save the role for you yep. and uh, goes back. And then we decide, yeah, that's what we're going to do. She's going to go back and I'm going to exit out and we'll keep in theory was we'll keep pay the same like yep. we've been living on one, one year while you're up with one salary and you're on mat leave yep. if we just do the old switcheroo yeah yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. we'll just keep that one salary going and i'll, I'll step away and launch uh peak and try and, and start building that and that's what we did with the eye of creating that pure flexibility yep so now it is like i got i for the last eight years i've been able to pick and choose and ramp up and ramp down clients etc such that it matches yep, the lifestyle, the lifestyle and, and, and the world and the demands of yep. kids and all that jazz. So that that's what really fueled that decision. But it was all, you know, if I really look and kind of take out some chunks of the story, it was all quite there. It was, yeah, it, all along. It's not it's, it's not a, a radical yep. out of left field. If I if I try and rationalize, yeah, yeah, rationalize totally. it, how did you um, and this one's interesting for me. How did you when you decide to do your own thing? How did you? How did you look at kind of building your clientele? How, what did that, were you, were you starting from zero? Did you have a couple going? Or, and what did, that, what did that slow, what did the building a client book look like for you? Yeah, that's, oh, now we're going to get into actually like work talk. That, um, well, this is selfish for me because <laughs> I'm, I'm like 17 months in, you, you, got, you got a few years in me, so now I'm just getting free yeah, advice. No, it was, it was uh, left with a few contacts from from downtown uh, there are people that I had worked with on kind of clients of kpmg or through other industry associations that needed some stuff done yep and then slowly snowballed it but it was very much a who did i know who did i know that thought enough of me to maybe recommend like oh now this guy's doing his own thing like yep. you know maybe you should give him a call and, and you know pick his brain because again he came out of whatever he was the guy who's running this, or he, he yep. did this with the cycling team, or he did this at Bow Cycle. And yep. he, now you give him a call. And that was, you know, the, the menu was a little bit different then because, again, when you're starting out, it's like any work is, is yep. work. Yeah, you got to pay. And then you, over time, you can get a little more greedy and, and picky, choosy of, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that type of client anymore. But yep. it was very much shake the network, let people know what you're doing. Even now, when I, when I talk to the, these, lawyers accountants etc i call it like forget the elevator pitch the elevator pitch is always it's the yep. realtor pitch right the realtor is always like well if you're thinking of buying or selling let me know mm -hmm. that was me was if you're thinking if you have any you know marketing help some brand help if you need a little bit of you know strategy consulting stuff if you want a little bit of whatever let me know yep. or if, if you know of anybody who has any of that kind of need let me know and i'm happy to chat with them yep and again you, you put that out there i call it like you throw the boomerang a few times if you throw it right it will come back yep if you don't throw it right, it, it won't. Mm -hmm. But if you play that game properly and you, you throw it to the right people and if the people like you and they know you and it's like, oh yeah, like kind of free agent, like yep. this guy was a yep. good guy or is a good guy to work for, you should call him or you know, you should call my buddy Hef who, who does this or my buddy Kevin who does this, then at least the ball's in my court, we'll chat about it and we'll decide. But if you're not, if no one's saying, call my buddy Jeff or yep. call my buddy whoever, yep. then that makes it pretty tough do you think that do you think were you okay to just to to build it like that <clears throat> to build it on not it's not a hope and a prayer it's essentially building good relationships and just and letting your past speak volumes because you did good mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. was that your only move and was that and you were confident that that was going to play out or did, were you yeah yeah did, yeah you, you weren't worried how long it's going to take for all for the for the you no, know, because I, I believed through again those other things that i had done i'd proven to myself that through all those other little passion projects and pieces that if I was to work on it and hustle it, yep. that it would, it would go, it would go right. Like there's similar to, do you think that's, do you think that's the high performance background? I think a little bit of that, like just take control and do it. What did, and, what did your folks do? Was there any, was there anything from, from no, 
Like, you know, no, my dad was a federal government guy, worked at the federal government for 43 years, like so right out like, from university and yeah. retired with so the federal government. So there's no, he's not wavering to do his own thing. No, no. <laughs> he was like, we had one job on his resume, like, you know, a couple of different jobs inside, but he was like yeah. with uh, Food and Drug Canada or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency yep. is what it turned into be. And my mom was sort of always office admin, yep. um, exec admin, helper with different yep. firms, companies, small companies, etc. But uh, no, there's never any there's never entrepreneurial been like piece in it. I, I think it, it truly was from seeing, and this goes back to like the, those years at, at the store and at Bo where like people and if seeing it would just come in like, oh, we need bikes. Like we're new to town, but our neighbor said, if we needed bikes, we just need to come here. Mm -hmm. Like we don't even know what we want. They just said, if you yeah. want to buy, go see Bri at Bo or go see Kurt or go see whoever at, yeah. at that store. Okay, well, here we are. Well, all right. If you have that kind of rep, if mm -hmm. you can now repeat that, mm -hmm. you don't have to be like, you know, a, a huge uh, independent retailer to yeah. play that game. If you have those types of quality relationships yeah. through personally held, et cetera, Everyone knows like that. That's LinkedIn long before LinkedIn. For like sure. that's just, people knows. Hey, do you know have a good babysitter? Yeah. Like oh, like in, and to condition people and ask for people like if your golf buddy, if your dad, whoever, something was complaining about their business or complaining something shitty's happening. Well, that sounds. You should maybe call this guy. I know yeah. this guy. Yeah. I've never worked with him, but I've heard good things about it. Right. Yeah. Go to that restaurant. Go to this bike store. That's how it worked. And I knew that if playing that game, well, it's not even a game. Just doing that yep. structure and that process, you know, another other buds, like there's no substitute for push-ups and chin-ups. Yep. Like if you do it, you'll get fit. If yep. you play the game that way, you'll get clients. will get your name out there. If you do good work and you ask for those yep. referrals and you tell, like I always say, I go, ah, oh, this is the best ever. Well, don't tell me, like tell your friends. Mm -hmm. Like I don't need to know. Cause yep. I, I kind of already assumed yeah. it was going to be, hence why you hired and paid me. Yeah. But tell your friends. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's funny. Well, no, that's rude. That's true. Yeah. Like, don't so tell this, me. This tell your friends. Works. Yeah. Don't tell the chef it's really good. Go tell your friends to book a reservation here and let them yep. experience it. Yep. That's where I. Well, that's why I wasn't really um, too fussed about you know, how how long this would take or if I could do it. Did you Did you have any timelines? Did you ha Did you like? Were you thinking like uh, you know I needed to have whatever, 12 clients in the next 13 months? Did you put numbers against it or were you just firmly um, a believer and do the right thing and it'll come back? Yeah, so like at risk of what I would advise clients to do now. Yeah, yeah, uh, don't, don't, don't mess this up. Yeah, no, I, I didn't have like hard, hard targets at the start. Like it didn't like, if I don't have this type of revenue or this much repeatable cash flow by X month, then I need to go back to, to getting a, yep. a paycheck. It was... I'm going to spend some time and, and build this and grow it. And you know, even on the early days, it was those first couple months were really sitting down doing the proper planning to figure out what kind of business I wanted to have, what types of clients I wanted to have, mm -hmm. you know, and holding true to a few things of, no, I'm not going to do work. If that, if that, if someone from here wants me to do this, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not where I want it to go. Like yep. there's still an element of, you know, big selfishness here of, it needs to be rewarding for yep. both. Yep. Like I'm not just uh, an input output machine where I some boring something or some asshole or someone I want to work with needs something from me. Yep. No, yep. right. It's not input output. There needs to be both sides. So I, I spent some time, whether it was formally documented or not, but I, it was clear in my brain, the type of clients I wanted to take and the type of work I wanted to do early on. And then it was a matter of sticking to that. And you have like, you have to, like I'm like, you can have this idea in your head and, and have the ideal client, but when that opportunity comes with, you know, it's like the, the C client shows up and you're like, well, it's X amount of money. Yeah. You really have to stick to your guns. And, and was that, was it tricky? Did you always be able to stick to your guns or was it a, a, an evolution of, you know, now I'm at a point where I can say no. Yeah. The latter. Yeah. Right. Cause you, you do, you, you always still panic a little bit, but yeah. Um, you know, a great example is a, a architect client that I have and, and they'll, they'll say like, you show up with bottomless pockets and you want me to design some gross run of the mill strip mall yep. that you'd see in any small town, rural, like, no, yep. 
like I'm still an artist. Like I still have to design something that's like aesthetically pleasing yep. and functional and form and all this. So, so that's their kind of yep. hard line. Go, yeah. If there's a little bit of, you know, a design element or some, you know, manifesto type of piece or some artistic equation that they can apply to it, then that kind of changes things. Yep. But if you want me to design something, no. Right. And that's similar to me. Do I want to go work with the, the big multinational ones again? I, I've done it. And now the answer is uh, no. I, I work with the more smaller owner operated yep. private companies because selfishly I can affect more change. Mm -hmm. I can help them call it quicker than yep. and I've done. I, I did some of that work and, you know, live and learn. It's OK. That's great. That's one business unit inside the mm -hmm. Canadian subdivision of the North American operation yep. of BP. Yeah. Well, great. One promotion, one higher later, that whole thing can be torn up and destroyed and it's gone. Yep. Whereas like as if it's working with some business owner who truly wants to change the business or add something or that's now going to have impact. Yep. It's not like I say a, a promotion and new strategy session and here's what we're doing. Yep. Um, and again, that's a little bit maybe selfish, but that, that's my need to try and help provide value. Was the there, um, was there a time, was there, um, uh, like a tipping point for you? Were you like three, four, four years in to, and all of a sudden things, you know, all your plans and ideas were kind of coming to fruition, you know, that the, the growth mode was kind of, you know, it was more, it was just happening. It was happening the way you, that you envisioned it happening. Was that, can you, can you pinpoint that, that back to a certain time period? Uh, yeah, time period, specific event, probably not time period for sure. And that's, you know, was around that third, even now. And granted, it was a little bit different world then. Yep. <laughs> even though that's not that long ago. But the biggest, some of the, the biggest revenue years, biggest client numbers years was around that year three, four. So you made it, you made it three, four. And, and that's when things really started going. Uh, pun intended, peak per se. But yep. that's when, yeah, the phone was ringing because... Someone else had said yep. this and this. And then it was starting to realize, do I want to do that again yep. or not? Like, yep. again, live and learn. That wasn't so much fun. You know, chasing for, in that example, invoices for, for six months because they're stuck in some global supply chain in, in Texas and someone hasn't hit the approve button and it's a big pain. Yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I don't yep. want to do that again for yep. all of these types of reasons. And so then that's when things, you know, had another little true up to go, how much do I want to do it? And then now even looking back at the biggest chunk and the motivator of it, is this still what I intended this thing to be? Mm -hmm. Like flexibility for yep. the fam and, you know, the, the boys and their activities and, and pick up and drop offs and all these other things as yep. opposed to now I'm right back to where I was, yep. you know, traveling X number of weeks a year or a month and doing this in a far off land and now getting a nanny to pick up. Like that's not what we... Mm -hmm. Well, my wife and I had, had planned for. So now it's like, no, nope, we're going to rewind it back and say no to this and accept this. That takes some, um, uh, well, confidence and like just inner strength to, to say that, to be able to answer that question, uh, you know, to, to fall back on the blueprint that you've laid out. Like yeah. That takes some, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Well, it's conviction. Yeah. And I don't, know, I don't know if courage is the right word, but it's one that I preach all the time. And that's the example I think I draw from for some of these clients is drawing from that experience of, yeah, I would have skied alongside and, and lots of the guys that I would raced with and were at some of those camps went on to World Cup careers and mm -hmm. Olympic careers. Mm -hmm. and, and But you see that. And even back to those high school years, like you don't just, and this is where, uh, you know, soapboxing for a minute about business planning and running your business, lots of people, and it's a cliche, but it's true, work in the biz versus on the biz. And as much as I, I kind of hate that, it's, mm -hmm. you just get, it's easy to get stuck just the doing hamster wheel? stuff. Yeah, hamster wheeling it or just doing whatever the next fire is. Yep. But if we take that back for a second, you look at the life of a, uh, an elite athlete or an Olympian, it's, these are the sets you do today. If you're yep. a sprinter, you're gonna do three of these, two of those jumps and that, that's it. Yep. And that's where you need to stop because you need to rest. Uh, but it's, it's a structured yep. thing. It's, or you go to the workout, if you wanna, lose weights or go to the gym. It's like, you have to do these exercises. Yeah. Oh, but that machine's busy. I'll just go to this machine and do this for a little while. And then you complain why you're not getting results mm -hmm. is because, well, you didn't follow the program. Yep. So now it's like, well, where's my business at? Well, how did I get it? Well, you didn't follow the program. You set the business out to do this, this, and this. Then this opportunity came in from the left field and then that one came a B and then now you're working on those things. But yep. 
where did these original things go? Yep. So that's lots of what I end up, you know, working in, in some clients is, is using that analogy of you don't just go to the gym and work out on any random machine. Mm-hmm. If you need to rehab your knee or rehab your something, you do the reps, yep. you do the exercises, you do them as prescribed, and you have faith that that's going yep. to work. And you, but you have to do that for a couple months to mm-hmm. make, is the knee going to get better? Mm-hmm. Is it not? It's not just on one day. Yep. Went to the gym, worked out on some random shit, Didn't hopped on the scale. <clears throat> what? Right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Totally. Went to the office, did a bunch of stuff. Did it, did it grow? Did it get a better business? Like, you have to stick, right? And that's, that's the militant or the conviction piece of, of where business sometimes get, gets hard. And, and what I see with, with companies that struggle is it's really easy to chase the squirrel or to get the next thing. Yep. And do you find with the, the, the high performance background that you can easily make the correlation between sport, you know, like you said, going to the gym and do all these exercises and then, and then spin it into the business world? Is that kind of, do you draw a lot um, from that? I think so. And I don't know if it's my own experience, but it's just, I think analogies and, and trying to find, you know, as consultant or advisor guy, trying to find what, what clicks with yep. the client, yep. but they're easy like everyone kind of gets it, right? Like yep. Everyone understands to some degree that you know you don't just wake up one morning and find yourself at the starting line of the hundred meter final yep. at an Olympic Games. It's like no, that took mm-hmm. years or decades of yep. religious. No, I'm not going to go party mm-hmm. New Year's tonight mm-hmm. because in eight months I have this race, or I'm not going to go and do this tonight in yep. the Olympic Village because tomorrow I have my qualifier. Like it's a series of conscious, militant questions, yep. and and that's most people can get that. So I don't know if it's so much my experiences. Like, again, I wouldn't call myself the elite athlete per no, but, se. But, but you're it was dedicated to something. Certainly, for... you know, well, yeah, I would have pursued it more than most, right? Yeah, for sure. And again, it's, you know, similar to you. And you look at yeah. quadrant hockey, you're like, what are we, a city of a million people? And there's like two goalies for every yeah, AAA team. So yeah. there's eight goalies in the city that are good enough to play at a certain level. <laughs> That's crazy. Sure, right? So <laughs> so um, skiing, yeah, I was in a, you know, smaller but from a, yep. a general sport perspective, I, I think I can, I, I certainly draw it because I'm a, I'm a fan of, of yep. sports, but I think a lot of people can get it if you break it down. Yeah, that makes sense. That way. Um, did you be surprised how, uh, where we're at right now? Um, we could talk for a long time because I'm, a, you know, on the business side of things, you're a super sharp cat and uh, I could learn a lot, but we have to put a bow on this sucker or else yeah. uh, we'll have the five hour Rogan. Um, the only question that's in the can or that I, that I ask everybody is when I say the word Calgary, where does your head go? And uh, I'll be very curious to hear how your answer is yeah. being a Calgarian. Yeah. I studied that one. I, I thought about that one. Instantly when you say that, the first thing that comes to mind is like heading west on highway one towards the mountains. And it's not like I'm trying to leave Calgary, but it's like, that's probably cause I've been up and down that highway a th- literally a thousand times in my life. But it, it's the connection to all these, I think that that's the, probably the word connection to all these different places, right? Whether it's connections and, and the memories I have skiing or mountain biking out there or riding or even just people connections, right? As, as born and raised. I don't think it's a it's a six degree separation. I think it's like a two or three. Mm-hmm. And you and I had chatted about that before. Like half the, the guests on, on your show, I'm also connected to somehow not mm-hmm. through you. Yeah. Right. Like I laughed at, at Rice's. I I was one of those kids in the the skateboard summer camps. In you know what is was Mark Kwan. It wasn't Rice. He hadn't started <laughs> totally. DJing by then. But that was you know one of those things. Yeah. You know and, and more. Jeff grew up in the same cul-de-sac as, as my wife, oddly enough. So it's like, that's a separate connection. Yep. But it's, it's all of these, you know, everything I have, and I know you've said this, but everything I have and everything I've learned is from these connections, whether it's connections to the store at Bow Cycle, whether it's connections to sport that have taught me things, whether it's connection to, um, you know, people that have connected me to other people to learn from or help out everything is is so interwoven here and i don't know and i think that's the difference right and i was trying to reflect on this coming in here today is you can feel connected if, if you're italian or Jack, like you go to these other yep. you know world monuments or i can go stand outside the Colosseum in rome and it's like wow there's a lot of important stuff that happened here yeah but I, i'm there as like a tourist I'm, i don't really feel like a true true connection but mm-hmm. if i'm driving down bonus road or I'm even going to the store to pick up a tube or I'm driving to 
you know, Banff. It's like I'm connected to those places for all these other like truly, you know, knots, warts, scars, wounds, etc. That am I truly connected to those places? Yeah. Like I've had crashes at that hill. I've, mm-hmm. I've, if I'm out riding my my bike now, I'll be like, wow, this last time I rode here was at provincial road race championships mm-hmm. in 1990, whatever. And I, I'll flash back and I'll remember these things of. So that's why you're you're connected to more meaningful things as opposed to yeah I'll stand outside I'll stand in Venice and be like wow this is yeah. neat but it's not the same personal connection like I would have with you know our couple degrees and, and the mm-hmm. other connections there like you know it's fine like here like this building like say folks like my mom worked across the street so this is model milk right yeah. but she worked for the Colpitz family which owned like this used to be a dairy mm-hmm. like it, the company was called model milk it's mm-hmm. not the name of the restaurant like it's on the sandstone brick at the <laughs> totally. top right so in her office across the street she'd played landlord for these guys and victoria's and whoever else was in here collecting money but in their office it's a shot across the street with milk trucks lined up and little drivers and their white milkman outfits yeah and this is so even weird here mm-hmm. we are mm-hmm. however many years later chatting in this restaurant but it it's still connected yep. in some weird shape or form yep. to my mom collecting rent um, from these guys. So I think that the answer, it's its connection to all sorts of crazy things that now have, again, ripple effect, butterfly effect on on your life. Dude, that's the best way to, when you say crazy things, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a very articulate person, but that's, you know, that is exactly <laughs> Crazy how, things is articulate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's where my head goes. It's just, you can't, it's so fun being born and raised here and, and having, you know, you're a good person you're, and then all of a sudden you attract good people and then this uh, two degrees gets down to one and a half. Yeah. It gets really, really small, which is why this city is so cool. Yeah, it's it's a crazy one. For yep. sure. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Hey, thank you. It was super fun. I'm uh, glad we made this happen. Right. Um, I'll uh, link up your site on all the different platforms so people can see what the hell you do. Hopefully you have a website. My <laughs> earlier guest, yeah. my earlier guest is like, shit, I got to put up a website. <laughs> So anyways, we'll uh, we'll do that. We'll talk soon. Right on. Thank you. Thanks, bud.